Gretchen Morganson. She is the senior financial reporter in the investigation unit at NBC News, a position she assumed in 2019. Her stories appear on NBCNews.com and as segments on NBC News Network and cable and streaming television shows. Previously, Gretchen spent two years as a senior special writer in the investigation unit at the Wall Street Journal and almost 20 years as assistant business and financial editor and a columnist at the New York Times. She began covering Wall Street, excuse me, world financial markets for the Times in May of 1998 and won the Pulitzer Prize in 2002 for her trenchant and incisive coverage of Wall Street in which she revealed deep conflicts of interest among powerful and respected brokerage firm analysts. A graduate of St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, Gretchen worked as a stockbroker in New York City in the early 1980s, was a writer at Money Magazine later that decade, and an assistant managing editor at Forbes Magazine in the 90s. She is co-author with Joshua Rosner of Reckless Endangerment, a 2011 New York Times bestseller about the origins of the mortgage crisis. She is co-author with Rosner of These Are the Plunderers, a book scrutinizing the private equity industry recently published this May in Simon and, by Simon & Schuster, and this is what Gretchen will be signing today over by the table. And we're all here to hear her talk, obviously. In addition to the Pulitzer Prize, Gretchen has won three Gerald Loeb Awards, one in 2002 for excellence in, the, in financial commentary, another in 2009 for her coverage of Wall Street, and a third with a group of New York Times reporters in 2009. The following year, she received the Elliott V. Bell Award from New York Award from the New York Financial Writers Association for her significant long-term contribution to the profession of financial journalism. In 2018, she received the Distinguished Achievement Award from the Society of American Business Editors and Writers for her outstanding contribution to business journalism. Gretchen has also served on two Pulitzer Prize juries, evaluating investigative reporting entries in 2009 and 10, and was a Loeb Award final judge for several years. We welcome back Gretchen for her third time. She was here in 2011, 2021, and now again speaking on behalf of the Women's Club. She is here with her husband, Paul, who I have not, I don't know, he's in the audience somewhere, but welcome, Paul. So on behalf of the Chautauqua Women's Club and the entire Chautauqua community, Gretchen, we are honored to have you with us. Let's give a warm Chautauqua welcome to Gretchen Morganson. Thank you so much, Kelly. I am so excited to be here again for the second time on the lush lakeshore grounds of the Chautauqua Institution. Kelly is such a treasure and that she has had me here three times. This is a three-peat, so thank you very much for being such a staunch supporter of my work over the years. Thank you for coming out on such a glorious day. Are you sure you want to hear the bad news I'm about to tell you? OK, I won't, I'll forgive you if you get up and leave in disgust and say, I'm going to the lake. It's too beautiful. It does really feel a little bit incongruous to take up my topic, um, the plunder of the American economy among such idyllic and beautiful, glorious surroundings. So the latest book is called These Are the Plunderers, How Private Equity Runs and Wrecks America. 
In it, my co-author and I explore how a small group of celebrated and wealthy financiers are deepening the gulf between rich and poor in America, one of our nation's most pernicious divides. Intricate and exotic financial dealings, like those at the center of the industry called private equity, are difficult to unravel so everyone can understand them. And yet, the work of these privateers is so pervasive, so poisonous, and so stealthy that it requires the spotlight. Thankfully, interest in the industry and its tactics is growing. The $64 trillion question right now is, what will it take to stop them? So here is the dilemma. American capitalism is supposed to enrich the many, providing opportunity for prosperity and a path out of poverty to vast numbers of people. It's critical, of course, that businesses and their investors are rewarded when they create jobs and improve lives across the US. But the financiers I am focused on are more predator than entrepreneur. They are extractors, not builders. They use borrowed money to buy existing companies, suck out cash and assets for themselves, and sell the companies a short time later, hopefully at a profit. Formerly known as corporate raiders or leveraged buyout kings, they can and they do destroy jobs, ravage pensions, harm customers, and deplete tax coffers, all while becoming billionaires. Before I go any further, I want to assure you all that I am not anti-capitalist. But I am against the kind of capitalism that enriches a very small number of elites at the expense of many. I am against the kind of capitalism that makes people say things like, the system is rigged. In my 30 plus years as a financial reporter, many of them at the New York Times, I have explored scams and scammers, market crashes, a mortgage mania, accounting tricks, and predatory lenders. But the financial titans in these are the plunderers are quite literally in a class by themselves. They are a group of elite men whose unrelenting pursuit of profits extracts wealth from workers, customers, pensioners, and taxpayers. But these are the plunderers is also about their enablers, federal and state regulators who have done nothing to curb the deal makers' voracious appetites, and politicians who protect these predators' lucrative tax breaks. Because they now control hundreds of billions of dollars, these men are shielded from criticism, spending fortunes on lobbying, biased research, and other means to manipulate outcomes and public opinion. One key focus of their lobbying, keeping in place a ludicrous tax loophole that allows billionaires to pay a lower tax rate on their earnings than a secretary, a bus driver, or a school teacher. 
these looters, as I call them, answer to almost no one. It is a heads-they-win, tails-we-lose approach to business, and it is unsustainable and wrong. If it is allowed to continue, the prosperity that can be achieved by many will continue to disappear into the pockets of this small group. Now, the kind of private equity I'm talking about really began to take hold in the 1980s, the greed decade, and the food fight known as the RJR Nabisco takeover set the tone for the future. Fees to the corporate raiders were enormous in that case, and debt levied onto the company totaled $25 billion, back then real money. Job losses came a few years later when the company slashed 9% of its workforce to pay some of that debt load. The deal dissected with brilliance in the book called Barbarians at the Gate was a harbinger of things to come. The transaction did not turn out well for investors. 15 years later, later KKR, the main firm in the deal, closed the chapter on the buyout and the firm's investors took a $730 million loss. Now, three decades after that deal, the barbarians are no longer just at the gate. They are at the controls of our economy. Because they operate in secrecy, though, you may not know how pervasive private equity has become in the United States. So here are some figures to consider. An astonishing 40% of hospital emergency departments are run by private equity companies who push doctors to put profits ahead of patients. An estimated 11% of nursing homes are owned by private equity, a percentage that is probably low because they hide between, behind their ownership practices. Some 9% of anesthesiologists are owned by private equity. As for the American labor force, 7% works for PE-backed companies, until they get fired, that is. The PE crowd has become so ubiquitous that it's entirely likely you buy goods and services from their companies every day without knowing it. I think it's interesting that these financial titans choose not to put their names on the companies that they take over. This secrecy also means that the wreckage they leave behind is difficult to trace back to its origins. Nevertheless, in recent decades, private equity has quite literally taken over our world. That coffee and donut I pick up on my way to work in the morning, the pre-K learning center where my colleague drops off his children, and the nursing home where my aunt lives, the dermatologist's office, the anesthesiologist at the local hospital, and the ambulance that rushes people to the emergency room there. Your favorite podcast, vacation timeshare, supermarket, sports team, pet care provider, even rental homes and apartments, all may well be owned and overseen by private equity firms that maximize for profits and a quick flip to another buyer in a couple of years. There are basically two pressure points that make private equity basically an unsustainable business model. One is the massive debt that they pile onto the companies they buy. 
This debt, of course, ramps up the company's interest costs, forcing them to cut expenses elsewhere to meet the burden. Often, the debt raised by the companies lets the financial firms cash out quickly. The second pressure point is the quick turnaround time to the sale of the company. PE firms want to sell the companies they buy within five to seven years, a relatively short-term time horizon. So they have to work fast to show results. This pressures them to cut corners, raise costs, and diminish the quality of their goods and services. Customers and workers take the brunt. Now, setting out to write these are the plunderers, I believed it was crucial to identify just some of the people who have been harmed by the deals that enrich these financial titans. That means workers, pensioners, customers, and taxpayers who end up footing the bills for their activities. These people's stories rarely receive coverage from financial reporters, but they are central to understanding the pernicious impact this industry is having on our society. These people have paid the price of private equity's power grab across America. And as casualties of the industry, they are growing in number each year. The circle of pain associated with private equity is wide and it's real. Workers who lose their jobs when the looters take over are the most obvious losers in this game. For example, among retailers taken over by the PE crowd, more than 500,000 jobs were slashed between 2003 and 2020. And a 2019 study published in the National Bureau of Economic Research looked at 10,000 company buyouts, finding that employment fell by 13% after a private equity takeover. <clears throat> but customers lose out as well by paying higher costs for the goods and services PE companies sell. And pensioners' retirement accounts are also diminished considerably by the lush fees that the private equity firms charge their investors. As I said, a wide circle of pain. So here are some of the real people who've been hurt by these financiers in recent years. My tally is nowhere near comprehensive, but I think it does begin to convey the astonishing scope of the plunderer's destruction. <clears throat> School, <clears throat> sorry. School children in New Madrid, Missouri, a Mississippi river town of 3,000 people in the state's Boot Hill region, went without books and their teachers lost their health insurance, thanks to the plunderers. Elderly nursing home residents in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Maryland were forced into painful physical therapy sessions they did not need to generate fraudulent Medicare reimbursements for a private equity firm headed by billionaires. Municipal water customers in middle-class Bayonne, New Jersey, saw their rates increase by 500%. They too were generating wealth for the financiers. Ditto for insurance policy holders across the country who received a fraction of what they were owed after their insurer was taken over by an early private equity firm. Patients in emergency departments in paying thousands of dollars in surprise medical bills are also among the victims. 
children as young as 13 years old, hired illegally to clean slaughterhouses, are here too. And if you think you've somehow escaped being pillaged by these predators, think again. Every US taxpayer picks up the slack when private equity companies defraud Medicare and loot company pensions, leaving the rest of us to pick up the obligations. These are the Americans on the other side of private equity's bounteous table. They are us. We stand in the shadows with them as the deal makers win awards and acclaim. Men such as Henry Kravis of KKR, Steve Schwarzman of the Blackstone Group, David Rubenstein of the Carlyle Group, and Leon Black, founder of Apollo Global Management. These are the boldest of the financial world's bold-faced names. In America, they are ubiquitous. On Wall Street, they are royalty. Extolled for their financial acumen, their charitable contributions and art collections, these men sit on prestigious museum boards and hold sway in the walls of Congress. Calculations of their net worths appear annually, and breathless news stories applaud their every move. Encomiums echo around them even as they profit from what may be the most selfish form of capitalism there is an industry that is an organized and key force fostering inequality in this country. So whom have these titans extracted their wealth from? People like Katie Watson, a disabled toddler whose parents won a malpractice award from an Arizona hospital. Katie's care was supposed to be covered by an insurance policy for as long as she lived. After an institution affiliated with Apollo Global Management took over her insurer, however, Katie received a fraction of what she'd been promised. Her parents lost their home paying for her care. But the Apollo partners at the center of the transaction made billions. Katie was just one of tens of thousands of insurance policyholders who received far less than they were owed because of the Apollo purchase. And although this outcome occurred three decades ago, it is likely to be repeated in the coming years as private equity firms have taken over more and more insurance companies. And what of those primary school children in Missouri who went without books? That occurred after Apollo bankrupted the town's largest employer, an aluminum smelter responsible for one third of the school district's revenues. Apollo, meanwhile, made three times its investment in the smelter bleeding cash from it over several years, and then leaving 2,500 people jobless in the region when it collapsed. Apollo had even convinced the state's utility commission to lower the smelter's electricity costs, a deal that required all other ratepayers in the state to cover the difference. That's what I mean by circle of pain. Then there are the 20,000 nursing home residents whose lives were lost over a decade in facilities owned by private equity, according to an undisputed academic study from 2021. Private equity owned nursing homes have 10% greater death rates 
than nursing facilities owned by other for-profit companies and nonprofit. The study found and attributed these horrifying outcomes to lower staffing, cost cutting, and inferior care, the academics said. I talked to Eddie Martinez, who lost his mother to COVID in a private equity-owned nursing home in California. He experienced this firsthand. He told me the nursing home managers there cared far more about profits than residents. And they tried to kick his mother out of the home when he had the temerity to complain about the care. Now, fawning financial reporters who follow the billionaire class don't write about Katie, they don't write about Eddie, or small town Missouri school children. But these are the people we need to hear from, the people we need to stand with. In tracking private equity's record over the past 30 plus years, I heard from others inside the pain circle. Mark Cannon, for example, was a Samsonite salesman who was laid off when the venerable luggage company was savaged by private equity in the 1990s. <clears throat> Cannon said to me, it's sad to see all these companies thrown on the bonfire after the financial people took all the assets they could out of them. After firing employees, shipping jobs to Mexico, and piling debt on Samsonite, Apollo Global Management calls it a success story on its website. The firm's takedown of Samsonite established Apollo's reputation, it says. Also in our pages, you will meet Ray Bravant, an emergency room doctor and Iraq war veteran who was fired by a private equity-backed staffing company after he demanded his hospital make changes that would be safer for patients. After the firing, he was unable to find full-time work at other hospitals in his town because they too were managed by the same staffing company that had ju just let him go. You'll also hear from Slado, a land defender and matriarch of the Gedimkin clan of the Wet'suwet'en tribe, a First Nations people in Canada, who are fighting a fracking gas pipeline funded by private equity that has already damaged their ancestral lands. And Christine Ribick, a courageous whistleblower who was terminated by her private equity-owned nursing home when she flagged unspeakable patient abuse. Ribick was victimized twice for trying to protect patients, once when she was fired by the company, and again when the United States Department of Justice dropped its $700 million Medicare fraud case against the nursing home chain in 2017. That decision let the chain off the hook. But no one would hire Christine after her role as whistleblower was publicized. I felt like killing myself, she told me. Only recently has she begun to be able to talk openly about the experience, and she is still not working. These people's stories are essential to understanding what private equity is doing to America. And new, emerge, new outrages emerge almost daily. Just last week, for instance, I learned that the financiers who bought Greyhound bus lines, have sold the company's bus stations to generate a return. 
Now, instead of waiting in an air-conditioned space in summer or a heated station in the winter, Greyhound riders must wait outside on the street for their buses to arrive. Selling the bus stations means profits for the predators as they quite literally kick their customers to the curb. Also last week, one of the nation's largest PE-owned hospital staffing companies filed for bankruptcy. <clears throat> American Physician Partners, it was called, and it staffed hundreds of emergency departments across the country. Now those operations are scrambling to figure out how they will be run going forward. Patients may absolutely be hurt by this development as emergency departments experience even more disarray and challenges than usual. Bankruptcies like American Physician Partners are not surprising. Once the plunderers come along and strip a company of its assets and pile it with debt, failures among heavily leveraged companies owned by private equity occur at 10 times the rate of companies not owned by private equity, academic research shows. Amazingly, the deal makers often generate riches even if the companies they plunder go bankrupt. That's because they typically invest only 1% or 2% of their own money in the transactions. And while they own the companies, they suck millions of dollars out of them in fees and dividends. <clears throat> but even before a cataclysmic bankruptcy event, expenses must be cut at these companies to meet the debt burdens. And that usually translates into higher costs for customers and employee layoffs slashed benefits, and reduced health care coverage. <clears throat> Private equity-backed companies increase costs for consumers, research shows, especially in the health care industry. A 2021 study from academics at the Wharton School found that PE buyouts led to an 11% hike in total health care spending at hospitals, for those with private insurance. Let's not forget the taxpayers wind up footing the bills when private equity bankrupts companies and deplete local tax rolls. Wayne, New Jersey, for example, where the giant retailer Toys R Us had been headquartered before it failed. Wayne had received almost $3 million a year in taxes from the company. That was 2.5% of the township's operating revenues. All disappeared when KKR bankrupted the company in 2017. To top it all off, private equity investments no longer generate higher returns than a low-cost S&P 500 index fund. So pensioners whose underfunded pension managers decide to plunge more and more money into private equity because they buy into the myth of outperformance are really hurting. Again, the circle of pain. Now, as I was preparing the book, I reached out to the private equity companies that I mentioned for their comments. I told them that I believed that their industry is depleting uh, the American economy, that it's a me first type of capitalism, and I wanted their views. Naturally, they disagreed with me. And one of the firms, perhaps the most prestigious of them all, was Blackstone, told me that my summary of their industry was a 1980s caricature, Gordon Gecko moment that had long passed. It was no longer accurate. 
They said that private equity doesn't contribute to the widening wealth gap. In fact, Blackstone told me, over the past 15 years, it has created 200,000 net new jobs among the companies it's taken over. <clears throat> Blackstone also said that the rate at which its companies filed for bankruptcy was far, far less than the tenfold figure that academic research shows. Wow, I said, 200,000 jobs, that's a lot. I'm impressed. And so I asked Blackstone, naturally, to provide the data behind those figures both the job creation numbers and the bankruptcies. I just thought, you know, trust, verify. I waited. I waited. A couple days later, I get the response. The firm respectfully declined, quote unquote, to provide backup for their claim. I am just supposed to believe what they say. As we are to believe that Blackstone's close management oversight of the companies that it owns somehow failed to discover <clears throat> that a slaughterhouse cleaning operation among its companies was employing over 100 children in facilities across the country. This cleaning company, known as PSSI, has been the subject of searing in-depth reporting, both on NBC News and 60 Minutes. Still, Blackstone and PSSI say they didn't know these children were 13 years old when they hired them. Given that three Blackstone executives sit on the board of PSSI, I find that hard to believe. By the way, I am not the only person who is skeptical about private equity. <clears throat> in fact, I'm in some pretty good company. Two months ago, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger held the annual meeting for shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. It's the occasion when these two financial geniuses answer questions and opine about the economy, their businesses, and the lessons that they have learned in their decades of investing in real businesses for the long haul. At this year's meeting, the subject of private equity came up in the Q&A. And Buffett and Munger spoke candidly about the business. Buffett, said the industry's returns, quote, are not calculated in a manner that I would regard as honest, end quote. Private equity as an investment, he said, quote, is not as good as it looks. Not as good as it looks, except to the plunderers. Certainly not good for workers, for patients, for pensioners, for taxpayers. Let's recap. Big private equity buyouts go bankrupt at 10 times the rate of their peers. Following a private equity buyout, an average of 13% of jobs were lost. 10% more deaths at private equity owned nursing homes. Along with increased emergency room visits, hospitalizations, and higher Medicare costs among residents of those homes. Private equity purchases of physician practices result in price increases of 14% among gastroenterologists, 16% for oncologists, and 9% for ophthalmologists. A study of 200 pension funds by academics at Harvard found that fees raked in by private equity firms depleted those pensions by 10% over 18 years. 
That was money that went into billionaires' pockets instead of to retired school janitors, firefighters, and transportation workers. Private equity has forged a new gilded age across America. But this time, the robber barons are not so much extracting the natural resources wealth of a young nation. Now they are extracting wealth from workers, the middle class, and taxpayers. It is no coincidence that the rise of the pri private equity barons coincides with a decline in wealth among the vast majority of Americans. In 1985, when this whole ball got rolling, the bottom 90% of American households held 35% of the nation's wealth. That might not sound like a lot, but it was a huge gain from the 15% that that group held in 1913. Most of that increase was thanks to the rising values of homes and pensions among workers. But by 2016, the wealth held by the bottom 90% had fallen again to 22%. Meanwhile, the very wealthy, the top 0.1%, held 7% of the nation's wealth in 1979, right before the private equity engine started. By 2012, they controlled 22%. In January 1932, Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office as President of the United States. It was a moment of deep despair. Millions were unemployed. Thousands of banks had failed, the stock market had cratered, and Americans were very afraid. As he rallied his countrymen, he acknowledged in unvarnished language the forces that had brought about the despair. Some feel quite familiar to me today. He cited, for example, the falsity of material wealth as the standard of success. He railed against the practices of the unscrupulous money changers indicted in the courts of public opinion. He called out conduct in banking and in business that too often has given to a sacred trust the likeness of callous and selfish wrongdoing. Amid the economic destruction and ruin of 1932, Roosevelt saw a ray of light. The money changers have fled from their high seats in the temple of our civilization, he said. We may now restore that temple to the ancient truths. That restoration, he added, lies in the extent to which we apply social values more noble than mere monetary profit. Ninety years later, the obsession with mere monetary profit, in FDR's words, is very much with us. It is driving economic inequality, increasing company bankruptcies, violating child labor laws, and crippling our health care system by putting profits ahead of patients. Private equity titans are a powerful driver of these outcomes, but they are not alone. They are aided and abetted by the overseers of public pension funds who look the other way when PE companies hire children to do dangerous work. They look the other way when companies conduct Medicare fraud or cheat by charging improper fees. The plunderers are aided by lawmakers who refuse to close the tax loophole 
that has created more billionaires in the last 10 years than in all prior years combined. And they are assisted by federal and state regulators who do nothing to stop the bleeding. In 2023, the money changers are immensely secure in their high seats in the temple of our civilization. Unseating them will be difficult because they have spent decades amassing more than enough money to cement themselves in place and in power. Last year, for example, Steve Shoresman, the head of Blackstone, received $253 million in annual compensation. This is the firm that hires children to clean slaughterhouses, the firm that wouldn't provide me with details for its claim of creating 200,000 new jobs in the past 15 years. There are indications, however, that some changes may at last be coming. The Federal Trade Commission is increasing its scrutiny on private equity takeovers, looking for unfair and monopolistic outcomes. Bankruptcies are taking down some private equity companies, showing in stark terms how unsustainable their business models are. There will be more of these failures before the year is out. There is some $70 billion in private equity company debt currently trading at distressed levels in the market, mostly because of rising interest rates. As the returns of private equity funds diminish, it can only be hoped that the huge pensions giving these firms the oxygen they need to operate will begin to see their unsustainability and reduce their partnerships with the plunderers. Last week, Blackstone reported difficulties in raising cash from investors for new deals. Money flowing in during the second quarter of 2023 plummeted 77% from last year. As consumers of health care and other services taken over by the plunderers, everyday Americans like us must protect ourselves from PE predation. The next time you go to your doctor, your dentist, your veterinarian, ask if their practice is owned by a private equity firm. If it is, consider going elsewhere. Before you have to rush to your hospital's emergency department, and before you identify a nursing home for a family member, find out if these operations are overseen by private equity. If yes, steer clear when you can. And finally, if your financial advisor pitches you on a, no, on a high cost, illiquid private equity investment, just say no. What does the future hold for these powerful pillagers? That, my friends, is up to Congress, the American people, and this question. Is there enough outrage over the hardship and inequities their activities produce to create change? We shall see. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gretchen. We're going we're gonna to start to do the Q&A, so if you want to queue up to the, either mic, that would be great. So we'll just take one time at it, one at a time, and I'll let you know. And if, I'll, I'll, I'll. <laughs> okay, who goes first? And pick up, pick up. All right. I know you. You're an Oli, or no, a, a close. You'll be next. You'll be next. Go ahead. Thank you for writing the book. Um, so it seems like what would really hamper the industry's growth would be if pension fund managers decided to stop investing in them. 
And uh, since it, you said that uh, investing in a passive index fund would outperform, did you talk to any of them why they're still investing in this asset class? That's a great question. And you know, I contact CalPERS, the huge California public employee um, pension, is the biggest pension in private equity. They lead the way. They are big, huge fans of it. Um, and I always call CalPERS because they set the tone in the uh, pension world. Now, CalPERS happened to own a piece of the fund, the Blackstone Fund, that owns the company that hired the 13-year-olds in the slaughterhouse. Okay. So I thought, I'm going to ask CalPERS, how do you feel about investing in a company that does that? <clears throat> they don't want to talk to me. They refuse to answer. I said, are you going to reinvest in another fund that is, you know, sold by the same company that would do that? Uh, no comment. It's very difficult to get an answer from these people because I, it, they're just so entranced by the Wall Street billionaires, and it's, it's hard to explain, but of course a pension fund manager does not have the experience, the expertise that these Wall Street Sharpies have, right? They're signed, they kind of feel like they're enthralled to them, to me. Now, when the returns were higher, I get it. They were doing the job for their pension beneficiaries. But that's no longer the case. So I don't understand why it is still such a love affair that goes on with these companies. And I can't get an answer out of them. One of the things that I think is very interesting that I hope to explore more going forward is <clears throat> pension fund managers and the private equity firms are aligned in one very important way. Pension funds, are, they're paid, their invest, chief investment officer, et cetera, they're all paid based on how well they do. And if the private equity fund can pretend that its returns are higher because they're private companies, they don't trade on the New York Stock Exchange, you can't see what their value is at the end of every day, they can mark those holdings where they want to mark them. They can put them at a value that's not accurate, like Warren Buffett said. In those cases, the pension fund managers are on the same page. So they are aligned. So I'm going to try to explore that element to see if that's more of an explanation of why I can't get people to come to the phone and say, hell no, I'm not going to invest with a company that employs 13-year-olds to clean slaughterhouses. I'll try it. Your turn. Yeah. I. Uh let me preface this, that I grew up with my family's comment about uh, politics. We have the best government that money can buy. But I would like you to speculate or tell us some of the policies, laws, whatever, that we might be able to do <coughs> to correct this or at least begin to make it more equitable and, you know, for everybody. Okay, the first thing, easy. Get rid of the tax loophole. But it's not easy because these people have so much money to throw at politicians that it never gets done. Obama said he was going to do it um, last year or the year before. Uh, Biden tried to do it, and Kirsten Sinema, who received a million dollars from private equity um, firms was the sole person who stopped that from happening. Yeah, that, that's why I preface my... <laughs> right. So getting rid of the loophole would be a huge start. Huge start. But there are things that can be done. For example, you can bar private equity companies from paying themselves first. 
taking out vast amounts of money when they put the debt on these companies. You could make a rule or a law that they could not take money out for five years. You could do things like that, but you know, I am just not convinced that regulation is the answer because these are very smart people. They will come up with workarounds. They will come up with things that will serve them even as they are obeying the law. We certainly need more transparency for who owns what. And the FTC is now finally starting to look at mergers. So if you were to stop some of these mergers, some of these roll-ups of physician practices, that would definitely help. So those are a few ideas. Okay. I'm not confident. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Um, I run a not-for-profit hospice that was the f is first hospice in the United States, but our industry has become largely a private equity industry, so most hospices are owned by private equity firms. Um, the government is trying to cure the excesses, but I would posit that the, um, it, the cure is worse than, than the, the actual illness because what's happening to us is half of the money that was supposed to help us during COVID went to hire more fraud investigators. We all have multiple audits going on at any given time. The worst of the government subcontractors gets paid by what they claw back from us. So what's happening is that the for-profit hospices are the ones that have the money to hire the lawyers, the deep pockets to pay the fines, and the cash flow to withstand prepayment audits. So it's kind of like a radiation oncologist that kills all the healthy cells around what it's trying to fix. So the hospices that are not for profit are going out of business and are largely either closing or selling to private equity. So what do you suggest um, be done to stop well, that? I think you just made my case. You just made my argument for me. I mean, this is what I'm talking about. You know not being against capitalism, but I'm against capitalism like this because it wrecks it for the people who are really trying to do the right thing. I mean, tell me your story. I would love to write about it, honestly. If, if there is something that can be done, I think, I think the media putting a spotlight on some of these issues, I know is, it does make some, has some impact, not as often as I'd like, but please, please, contact me. I would like to know about that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much for your such interesting and uh, revealing presentation. Thank you. It takes a great deal of courage to do what you're doing. And it seems like it going against sharks. It's quite dangerous. <laughs> So my question relates to, you mentioned that you in this business investigating, reporting 30 years. Did you face repercussions uh, from those sharks that you are so brave fighting? Well, first of all, um, they are sharks. But second of all, I usually have powerful institutions behind me. So I am not alone. I am not like some journalists in countries around the world who are operating without a net, who do get murdered by people. And that is not my circumstance, thankfully. So <clears throat> yes, I mean, I get a lot of pushback. Uh, if, if I make mistakes, they are all over me, of course, and I don't blame them, but I've been sued, I've been threatened, but it really isn't it doesn't stop me, it only makes me want to do it more. And so the degree to which people, you know, the degree to which people come at me, it really only just strengthens my resolve. I also have very resolved, resolute people behind me, my editors who really want <clears throat> this work to be done. And that's rare and rarer than ever in newspapers now and in, in the media business. Investigative reporting has really been decimated. So I'm luckier than most, but I say bring it on. 
Thank you very much, and please continue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate on one point that you made real clearly and then you touched on it a few times. Um, my own career has been about 45 years doing ERISA litigation, uh, dealing with pension fund investing, and then from an investment standpoint, being an advisor to the governing bodies of statewide pension funds, about 25 out of the 50 I've been involved with, and then private corporate labor management pension funds, um, always advising either, either advising the governing body, the investment committee, board of trustees, or stepping in and being the investment decision maker mm -hmm. over these funds myself. And you made a comment about just look the other way. I've got uh, one question and one observation you might find helpful. The observation is very frequently the rules governing the governing body are pretty porous in terms of travel and entertainment and pay to play. And especially with the public pension funds, pay to play means someone who runs for the office of a member of the board of trustees, needs money to campaign and win, and guess who helps fund right. the election. <clears throat> right. So having clear ethics rules on pay to play and enforcement and visibility into them is one possible aspect of your uh, inquiry. But the, the question that I've got is whether uh, you think that there's anything that can be done with fiduciary standards. Basically, I mean, the short form, earn as high a return as you can with an acceptable level of risk. And the historic fact, and it's still the case today, is that if you add private equity to a diversified portfolio, it's very likely to increase the rate of return without increasing risk based on modern concepts of diversification. So I see the trustees, the governing body in a box being concerned with the real bad impact socially that you point out and yet being under a fiduciary standard that right. in many ways compels them to do bad stuff. Well, again, the returns are, are regressing to the mean of the S&P 500. So that outperformance, that alpha, as it were, is not as much as it was. Mm -hmm. So that should be a, a reason to yeah, think that's twice. De that's debatable, but go on. I'm sorry. So according to you know, some academic studies mm -hmm. that I've seen. So as far as the um, enforcement that you talk about of pay to play, I have an entire part of the one chapter of this book about the SEC who put in place new rules about pay to play with pension funds mm -hmm. after some of the scandals that occurred mm -hmm. when you had bribes being given to pension right. funds, okay, by these very people. The, S the SEC started out strong with fining people who were doing that, fining the firms, and then they just stopped. Mm -hmm. They started giving people waivers they didn't have to abide by the rule. Apollo, all of these firms got waivers. Mm -hmm. So again, there was a rule in place. It is not being followed. And the SEC is not enforcing it, which I do not understand. Okay. But yes, thank you very thank much you. for the question. Yes, hi. Uh, hi, thank you for the talk. Um, when a private equity firm buys some entity, someone sells it and in general, someone's going to help finance it. To what extent is that seller and the financer part of the, the, the should be blamed? The the seller should be what? Uh, the, well, the, this this someone has to sell it. Right. Yes. And someone else may finance it. Yes, the bank. And to what extent the. Uh, the evils, and I use that word in somewhat in quotes. The <laughs> I evils, love that word. The evils of private, the private equity people, to what extent should the seller and the financer share some of the blame? Okay, very interesting. Um, my husband said this to me the other night. What about all those people that get rich by selling their companies to private equity? Aren't they part of the problem? Well, yes and no. So in, in this most recent bankruptcy of American Physician Partners, the doctors whose practices were purchased by the private equity firm got stock in the private equity firm. So they did not get cash. They got stock. That stock is now worth zero because the company is bankrupt. They are now down at the bottom of the capital stack. They're an equity holder. All the creditors are ahead of them. They will not get paid. 
but many times they do get cash. And yes, I think there should be alternatives to selling to private equity if you don't want your company to be ruined because the numbers do show that that occurs. You could set up an employee stock ownership plan where you could sell it to the employees. Those are really some excellent ideas for how to sell a company that you don't want to sell to private equity, but you're ready to walk out the door because you're ready to retire. <clears throat> so employee stock ownership is a possibility, and that's much more equitable than this arrangement. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Hi. Hi, sobering message for us all. How significant of a research team does it take to allow you to draw the conclusions that you're drawing? Because you're looking at a tremendous amount of transactions and really doing some in-depth research. Well, I've relied a lot on academic research and it's unbiased academic research. A lot of private equity firms will say, oh, read this report, read this academic research. It says, it counters your point of view. It says things are great, that we do wonderful things, that we build companies, not tear them down. But often those academic studies are conducted by people who are paid by private equity. So you have to be careful about the studies you do rely on. So the ones I have relied on are completely unbiased. And they're longitudinal studies that really take into effect a lot of different data points over a long period of time. I couldn't do that myself, it's just too hard. But that is where you start. And then of course, going to the companies themselves and saying, show me your performance, show me how many jobs you've created, show, many, show me how many companies went bankrupt. And when they won't do that for you, Instead, they give you a number that you're supposed to just trust. You really start to understand the dynamic. But it is a, it's a heavy load, but a lot of it was carried by what I consider to be trusted academic sources. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I promise you I don't represent the Private Equity Defamation League. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I do have a... Tough question. Okay. And the tough question is, we've assigned the synonym to private equity of plunderer. There are 5,000 private equity firms. 5,000 private equity firms with which I have experience all aren't plunderers. Right. There's the plumbing company, the man comes home and he has, sees his cardiologist and he has so many heartbeats left. And he sells to private equity and he can monetize his life's work. I don't think that that private equity group is a plunderer. I am talking about the very large, big, huge firms that use heavy debt to buy companies and that extract fees and dividends from those companies throughout. I am not talking about small private equity firms that put equity, actual equity, into a company. I'm talking about this very yep. specialized, heavy leveraged, big firm dynamic. And, and the examples you used, I think you're absolutely right. But I think out of the 5,000 private equity firms, to characterize them in, categorically as plunderers and predators, I think is a little harsh for the small people who are providing social utility to entrepreneurs who are trying to uh, monetize their life's work. Well, you can read, if you want, the book, and I make it, I make it clear that I'm, this is who I'm talking about. I am not talking about the small folks, the people who use equity to buy companies, not debt. Those are not, these are the very powerful people I'm talking about, the Apollos, the Carlisles, the and, and Blackstone. And those, I think you're absolutely right. And they dominate, they really dominate. Thank you. That was not such a tough question, by the way. Okay. <laughs> Last question. Uh, you spoke about many companies that take the, these plunderers that affect our lives. Uh, what scared me the most was the woman uh, that had the disability insurance policy and she was wiped out. How do these companies wipe out an insurance contract? Well, this is going to be something that we're going to see more of, I'm, I'm, I'm unhappy to say. Apollo uh, bought a company called Athene. It is an insurance company 
they basically, it's now merged with Apollo. So Athene has many insurance policies that it backs with investments that it makes. It is more likely to take higher risk with those investments, which is a problem for people who are counting on money down the line. Athene is taking over pension risk transfers from companies like Bristol Myers, Coors, uh, Lockheed. They have now 400,000 pensioners that are relying on them because their companies sold the pension assets to Athene. Athene is a risk-taking company. Its insurance, it's the company that backs the insurance claims is domiciled in Bermuda. Good luck trying to get your money out of that thing if it fails. They are taking more risks. They have more lower quality assets so that they can pay higher rates to the pensioners. It's something that is playing out as we speak. In fact, last week, the Department of Labor held hearings about whether there needs to be more oversight of private equity purchases of pensions. And there were people who were testifying to that fact, to say, yes, we need more. We need to, we need to be sure that these are rock solid companies who are taking over, because Bristol Myers pensioner doesn't have the PBGC backing them anymore when Athene takes over. They'll be out of luck if something happens to Athene. So the DOL, the Department of Labor, is looking at this. Write a letter to the Department of Labor. You're speaking mostly about pension funds, but what about insurance contracts? Like, I'm from Florida. And well, if the insurance company fails, they will not be paid. Well, now, it'll, it'll depend on your state insurance right. commissioner and how much the state fund has to pay what's different, what, you know, the, the difference between what the assets sold by the failed insurance company generate for the people who own the policies. But this case I'm talking about happened in 1991. It was Executive Life, it was California. It failed because Executive Life had bought so many junk bonds and junk bonds failed, the market went like that and the company was, went into receivership. So insurance companies do fail. They haven't for a long time, there haven't been a lot of big ones. But the concern is that the risks in the investment portfolios are not proper for the people who are really relying on those policies to pay out over time. Yeah. Well, don't most states, I'm from Florida, uh -huh. and they regulate the amount of risk that a company can take and what they can invest in. I'm still like life insurance policies, long-term care policies, as opposed to pensions specifically. State insurance regulators are not, they're, they're, it's spotty depending on, you know, some are, some are better than others, some are more aggressive than others. I am not familiar with Florida, but I know Iowa, where Athene is located, they selected Iowa because it's more relaxed. Yeah. Okay. And that's what they do, these people. Anyway, thank you all for staying and coming. I'm just going to say one more.